Hey gang, welcome back. Okay, so now that we've messed around with some rearrangements and we learned the mechanism and how to complete the reaction of the dehydration reaction that utilizes an E1 mechanism, now let's kind of tone down like the difficulty, I guess, and do a little bit of ether synthesis. Let's make some ethers. So to recall, just to draw you guys an example of an ether, remember, ethers are that type of functional group where you have an oxygen in the middle kind of of a carbon chain and has carbons on both sides. So this is an ether, this is diethyl ether, a good nonpolar solvent as we remember from the substitution elimination station series. Uh, what's another one? Let's, uh, here's another one. Whoa, that is some funky bond line. There we go. This one's actually called THF, another good solvent. And to give you one more, so these are both symmetrical ethers, or we can have non-symmetrical ethers, right? We can have something like we have a methyl on this side and an ethyl on that side. Okay, so that's enough of like a trip down memory lane as far as identifying the functional group, but let's figure out how we can make them, right? Okay, so in my mind, there's kind of like three-ish ways to do this. The first way is to just attack in SN2 with an alcohol. And this hopefully should make sense slash be a reminder, actually, you know what, not SN2, SN1 with an alcohol. And here's what I mean. So let's just say we had, you know, isopropyl bromide, right? And let's say we threw in some, let's say ETOH, right? So that would look like this. So remember, right? Let's look at our substrate. He's a secondary carbon and he's attached to a good leaving group, bromine, right? So we have a polar protic solvent. Pretty good conditions for SN1, right? Well, you can bet I'm going to kind of draw some janky arrows down here that I can have this bromine leave through solvolysis, right? And if I were to draw my carbocation intermediate, it would be that secondary carbon right there. Remember, look for shifts, but it doesn't really look like we have any appealing shifts, either hydride or methyl here. So then let's enter in our nucleophile. So it would be, I'm actually going to draw out the, uh, the uh, ethyl piece. And remember, the carbon, the atom that is nucleophilic here is the oxygen and the alcohol. So if we go in and attack, right, that secondary carbocation, what do we have but our original carbon chain and directly now attached to an oxygen, which has this proton we're gonna pick off, and another carbon piece, right? So he has a positive charge. And let's just say this bromine comes back and does us a favor by grabbing this H+. Draw the arrow over here. So you can see, this is a reaction we've done before, but now we can see the value of being able to produce ethers with it. Or if you see this in a complete the reaction section, you can say, oh, you know what? I'm going to end up with an ether functional group. Okay, so that's one example. Let me erase this. We'll go over another new way called, and it's probably a little more rapid, it's called the Williamson Ether Synthesis. Long name, sounds scary, super easy. All right, gang, now that we saw you can use SN1 as a tool to produce ethers, let's look at another way called the Williamson Ether Synthesis. And honestly, it's an SN2 pathway, so we can now see that we can and I'll keep track of this over here, we can make an ether through SN1, and we can make one through SN2. However, remember in SN1, we're using alcohols as our nucleophiles, right? We need to kind of beef up the nucleophilic strength of our nucleophile for this SN2 reaction, and that's exactly what the Williamson ether synthesis helps us do. Here's kind of what we can expect. So the new reaction we're going to use is say you have any alcohol, I'm just going to use ethanol, and you just subject it to some elemental sodium, right? Just kind of similar to the Grignard reagent. What you actually kind of do in this transformation 
is you produce an alkoxide. You deprotonate the oxygen, making, giving him a negative charge, making him definitely more nucleophilic, and that's offset by the spectator ion, Na+. Okay? You don't need to know the mechanism how, of how this occurs, but if you just take any old you know, alcohol, subject it to some elemental sodium, then you get this alkoxide, which has a negative charge. It is more nucleophilic than just a regular old alcohol, and that's going to be good for an SN2 reaction. Okay, so let me erase this, and we'll just, I'll show you a quick example. So let's just say, I don't know, we have some type of uh, cyclohexane ring here, and off that cyclohexane ring we have one carbon and an alcohol. And let's just say I gave you guys an arrow with a couple of reagents listed. So let's say if I gave you a first step of elemental sodium, and I don't know, let's say I give you just CH3Cl, a little methyl chloride, right? So what's going to happen? So in these multi-step reactions, I don't know if I've done one in a video with you guys, but uh, I usually kind of just write in the margins uh, what happens, and then, you know, in the big box of right or wrong, in these complete the reaction problems, I usually just, uh, I wait to kind of do all my steps over here, and then I put the final answer in the box. So first step, right? We're going to look a little bit like this, right? We're just going to make an alkoxide, negative charge, and you can include that sodium spectator ion. It doesn't really matter if you do, it doesn't matter if you don't. And so right here, we've kind of beefed up the nucleophilicity of our original uh, reactant, right? Big word. Um, so now what we're going to do is we have this methyl substrate, great for SN2, right? Because primary methyl situations, perfect for backside attack. And we have a good leaving group in CL, right? So if I'm going to do a little arrow drawing over here, I'm thinking this is going to go a little like this. The oxygen comes in, attacks the... CH3 from behind, you kick off chlorine, and what do you get but, let's draw the original ring. Right off the ring we had a carbon that was directly attached to the oxygen, but remember he just attacked that CH3. So we added one more CH3 to the mix, and you can clearly see that we just produced an ether. Okay, what I want to do is I want to erase this. I want to show you guys how to undo an ether, how that process works, and then I want to show you a mechanism, and we'll call it quits. Okay, gang, so now we've seen that we can use solvolysis and SN1 and alcohols as our nucleophile to produce ethers, and we've seen through SN2 and the Williamson ether synthesis, we can produce alkoxides to kind of do that job with backside attack, producing ethers. So now I want to show you guys how to undo ethers. Okay, so let's kind of go through this together. What I want to do, and this might, may or may not be a problem on your worksheet, but uh, let's say if I gave you something along this line. Actually, you know what? Let's do this, and let's do something like this, okay? And let's say I subjected this ether to a strong acid, like let's say HCl. Okay, I'm going to tell you that this is going to break up your ether into the two components it started out with your substrate with a good leaving group, and your alcohol, okay? So here's kind of how I go about this. So just like alcohols, right, ethers are, you know, a hub of electron density, right? This oxygen, he has electrons to give. He's kind of cool with picking up H+. And we have a strong acid, so you better bet he's going to grab that high, that this proton. And if, the, if I drew the bond in between them, the electrons would get dumped off onto Cl minus. So again, if I'm going to draw some ratchet arrows below to kind of finish out our mechanism, here's what we kind of get from that little acid-base exchange. Right? We now have our uh, ether oxygen, and he has an H plus on him. Right? He has a hydrogen, and he has a positive charge because he donated a lone pair to make a bond. So. Here's the point where Cl- is going to come back, and he's going to attack, right? And he's going to, because if you can kind of see, doesn't matter which side, but this is a good lead. So if I was going to attack this car, oh, sorry, this carbon right here, couldn't you see that the rest of this would be a good leaving group, right? It's just an alcohol. 
right? That's okay. And at the same time, right, directly off of this hide or this oxygen, if I attacked this carbon, he would be a good leaving group also. But here's what you kind of have to think of, right? We're doing SN2 right now, right, with this chlorine. We're attacking a substrate carbon from behind. Do we want to attack a primary carbon in the case of this carbon right here? Or do we want to attack a secondary carbon? My answer to you guys would probably be this carbon right here. I'm thinking this chlorine is going to come in. He's going to attack right here. And once we do that, these electrons are going to leave with this oxygen. So we're kind of severing this bond right here into the two components of the ether that we started out with. So let me draw our final products up here. That means one, two, three carbons. And on my dot carbon, I now have a Cl. And if you look over here, right, I have one, two, three carbons. And on the middle carbon that I've dotted, we have an OH. So you can see our two components were propyl chloride and isopropanol. And this makes sense, right? If we kind of did this in reverse, right? This is our alcohol, and we're trying to attack a primary carbon to form our ether. Because if we did it the opposite, right? I have an alcohol over here trying to attack a secondary carbon for SN2. That's not great. So remember, if you're going to undo an ether, protonate the ether oxygen, and then whatever your kind of conjugate base from the protonation is, whatever nucleophile you're dealing with, look to see which carbon is better to attack. Okay, I'm going to erase this, we'll do a quick mechanism, and then we'll close the book on ethers. Okay gang, so we're going to kind of compare these two reactions, it's going to be a little food for thought. I have a problem similar to this as the last problem on your ether worksheet, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on here. Okay, so let's look at what we have, right? So if I see I have this oxygen, right? He's, it's more, to be more specific, he's an alkoxide, right? And, you know, we see we have a carbon with a good leaving group on the end, all in one chain, right? So here, I'll dot him. So what I think is going to happen here is if you look at your chain, right? This oxygen, if I give him a 1, this carbon a 2, this carbon a 3, 4, and this dot carbon a 5. If I was to have what's called um, backbone biting, that's what this, is, this would be called, where I have this oxygen circle around and attack this dot carbon right here, we'd form a five-membered ring. And five-membered rings are good enough to be stable, right? There's not too much ring strain like there is in a four-membered ring. So what's going to happen is that just that. We're going to backbone bite. This oxygen is going to come around and attack this carbon right here, primary, good for SN2. And we have a good leaving group, so this chlorine will leave. So as you can see, right, I'm going to form a five-membered ring. So usually here's how I draw rings with ethers in them. I usually draw the size of the ring, and I pick a spot to kind of erase a little bit, and then I kind of just insert my oxygen. So you can see that right here we just had a, an intramolecular ether synthesis, right? Intramolecular because it was within the molecule. Okay, that's one reaction I want to talk about. Now this one down here, all right, we have, I'm going to number my carbons again, one, two, and then this oxygen counts as three because he's our nucleophilic atom. And we have one, two carbons over here. And I'm going to dot this carbon right here. So if we're going to draw this little mini ether mechanism, right, this oxygen is drawn to this carbon right here, it's partial positive. He's primary, good for SN2, and we have a good leaving group. So he's going to come over and attack this carbon, and I'm going to kick the electrons onto that chlorine. And the ether we're going to make is this. If I draw this piece right here, one, two carbons, and this oxygen, and then I have one, two over here, right? We just made diethyl ether. So you can see we have a five carbon ether up here, and a, or sorry, five atom ether up here, and a five atom ether down here. So if I told you guys that this reaction up here is faster than the reaction down here, 
here's the reason why. If someone ever asked you this, here's what you have to think. You have to think of thermodynamics, right? We went from one reactant to one product, okay? Down here, we went from two reactants to one product. If you can throw this all the way back to Gen Chem Boot Camp, remember, there is this second reaction, the entropy is bad. We're going from, we're going from a system with more disorder in the reactants to a product system with less disorder, right? The entropy is bad. However, up here, the same reaction occurs, but our entropy relatively stays the same, right? Qualitatively speaking, right? We go from one reactant to one product versus two reactants to one product. That's why this reaction is faster. The thermodynamics are better. Okay, that closes the book on ethers. We just have one video to talk about epoxides, and then we are done with you know, all these alcohol derivatives, and then we'll be plunging straight into alkenes.